And now it is my great pleasure to introduce the head of Building 8, Regina Dugan. In my entire career, I've never seen something as powerful a force in the world as the smartphone that didn't also have unintended consequences, sometimes grave, sometimes every day. If we intersect this device with the mission of Facebook, we find that this little black box has allowed us to connect to people far away from us, to share moments of our lives, and to do so unconstrained by time or distance. But it has also cost us something. It has allowed us to connect to people far away from us, too often at the expense of people sitting right next to us. We've all begun to feel it. We don't talk about it much because most of the discussion goes like this. If you were just strong enough, if you had enough willpower, you would put down that addictive drug that is your smartphone and honor the conversation in front of you. Usually this is said in a moment of anger or judgment. But that's the wrong narrative. And it's a false choice. This device is important. It allows us to be curious about the world beyond the one we can see right in front of us. It allows us to have empathy for people we might not otherwise know. It allows us to be adventurers and explorers, humanitarians and citizens of the world. That's good. It's just that we know, intuitively and from experience, that we'd all be better off if we looked up a little more often. Now, voice interfaces have attracted much attention of late. Voice is referred to as the new type of OS. It's convenient, that's true. It reduces complexity, that's also true. I think that voice is important but not for these tech-centric reasons, rather for a decidedly human reason. Because these new hardware platforms have enabled us for the first time in a long time to crawl out of this little black box and be back in the room where our lives are and where so many of the people we care about exist. Now, when viewed in this way, we realize that we've only begun to scratch the surface of what's possible. There is much, much more to do. So today and tomorrow, this is our goal at Facebook, to create and ship category-defining consumer products that are social first, to do so at scale, and to power this with a breakthrough innovation engine modeled after DARPA. Products that recognize we are both mind and body, that our world is both digital and physical, that seek to connect us with the power and possibility of what's new, while honoring the intimacy and the richness of what's timeless. Products that refuse to accept false choices. So let me give you an example of what I mean. Let's start with your brain. Your brain has 86 billion neurons that fire a thousand times per second. Now, they don't all fire at the same time, so let's decrease that by a factor of 100. That would mean your brain is capable of producing about one terabit per second. About 40 HD movies are streaming in your brain every second. Now, if you haven't had your coffee yet, you might be moving about 10 times slower, so let's just say it's four HD movies every second. And herein lies the problem. How do I get all of that information out of my brain and into the world? What are my choices? Well, I'm 
I'm speaking to you right now, and I'm transmitting at about 100 bits per second. That's the bandwidth, bandwidth equivalent of a 1980s dial-up modem. So here's what we have. Four HD movies per second streaming over a 1980s dial-up modem. Speech is essentially a compression algorithm and a lossy one at that. That's why we love great writers and poets, because they're just a little bit better at compressing the fullness of a thought into words. So what if you could type directly from your brain? It sounds impossible, but it's closer than you may realize. And it's just the kind of fluid human-computer interface needed for AR. Even something as simple as a yes-no brain click would fundamentally change our capability. A brain mouse for AR. The woman in this video has ALS. She is completely trapped inside her body. She cannot move or speak, but she is typing with her mind, not with eye blanks, with her mind. An array of electrodes the size of a pea has been implanted where her brain would normally control her, mo her motor functions. The electrodes record her neurons firing when she imagines moving the cursor. Then the computer learns to move it for her. Using this system, she can type eight words per minute. She is typing at eight words per minute directly with her brain. Now, that's less than one-third the speed that you can type on a smartphone, but it is lightning fast compared to silence. So what if instead of using imagined arm movements, we could decode speech directly? Now, to be clear, we are not talking about decoding your random thoughts. That might be more than any of us care to know. <laughs> and it's not something any of us should have a right to know. Think of it more like this. You take many photos, you choose to share some of them. Similarly, you have many thoughts, you choose to share some of them. We're talking about decoding those words, the ones you've already decided to share by sending them to the speech center of your brain. A silent speech interface, one with all the speed and flexibility of voice, but with the privacy of typed text. Better yet, with the ability to text a friend without taking out your phone, or to send a quick email without missing the party. No more false choices. Now, Mark Chevalet is the lead for this effort. He's a physicist neuroscientist, and six months ago, he had the idea that this might be possible. Today, we've assembled a team of more than 60 scientists, engineers, and system integrators. They specialize in machine learning methods for decoding speech and language, in optical neuroimaging systems that push the limits of spatial resolution, in the most advanced neural prosthetics in the world. And we're just getting started. Together, we have a goal of creating a system capable of typing 100 words per minute, five times faster than you can type on your smartphone, straight from your brain. Over the past three decades, work in artificial speech recognition has produced powerful tools to decode text from brain activity while people are speaking. This is real data showing the remarkable result of mapping brain signals to text directly. Now, these systems don't currently operate in real time, and what's more, they require surgery, implanted electrodes. And that simply won't scale. <laughs> so we'll need new non-invasive sensors, sensors that can measure brain activity hundreds of times per second and precise to millimeters. 
and without signal distortions, even as they read through hair and skin and skull. Now, no such technology exists today. We'll need to develop one, and we think optical imaging is the best place to start. Optical imaging may be the only non-invasive technique capable of providing the spatial and temporal resolution we need, and thanks to technological improvements in performance, cost, and miniaturization driven by the telecommunications industry, we have a very big wave to ride. So how do we get optical techniques in the sweet spot of performance, sampling hundreds of times per second and precise to millimeters? We start by filtering for quasi-ballistic photons. Now, if you've ever pressed a red laser pointer to your finger, you know that your whole finger glows red. The reason you don't see the original resolution of the laser pointer is that most of the photons scatter many times as they pass through, flying off in all directions. The photons are diffuse, and diffuse photons won't give us millimeter resolution. Now, due to chance, some don't scatter at all. These are ballistic photons. If we filtered only for these, we would retain the original resolution of the laser pointer. It's just that there are too few of them to see. Ballistic photons won't give us enough signal. Quasi-ballistic photons are somewhere in between. They scatter just not too many times. And if we get the trade-off just right, we can get the spatial resolution we need and have enough photons to measure. Okay, so the next problem to solve is speed. Optical techniques are fast, which is good because speech is encoded in the high-frequency oscillations of neural activity. That means we'll need to sample hundreds of times per second to decode them. But today's optical imaging systems they don't measure neural activity. They measure blood oxygenation, which is a time-integrated sum of neural activity. It is robust, but it is too slow to capture speech. Instead, we will need to measure the neural activity directly by capturing instantaneous changes in the optical properties of neurons as they suck in sodium and spit out potassium. In a few years' time, we expect to demonstrate a real-time silent speech system capable of delivering 100 words per minute. A speech prosthetic, you might say, for patients in need, a step on the path, as Michael said, to making input for AR more natural, a first prototypical system capable of measuring speech-related neural activity non-invasively on our way to a system that scales. That would be crazy amazing. But it's only the beginning of what's possible. It gets better because your brain activity contains more information than what a word sounds like or how it is spelled. It also contains semantic information that tells us what those words mean. In your brain, a cup is not the label cup. It is a man-made object that you can hold in your hand, one that carries liquid for people to consume. Understanding semantics means that one day you may be able to choose to share your thoughts independent of language. English, Spanish or Mandarin, they become the same. After all, the word cup or taza or chabe is just a compressed thought. And if we can make it possible to communicate directly from your brain, what if we could make it possible for you to hear through your skin? You have two square meters of skin on your body. It is a complex network of nerves that transmit information to your brain. Braille, invented in France in the 19th century, taught us that people can learn to interpret small bumps on a surface through their fingertips as language. The Tadoma method, developed in the early 20th century, went well beyond Braille. 
based on work with Helen Keller, it sought to create a scalable method for children who are both deaf and blind to communicate. As it turns out, the vibrotactile sensors embedded in our skin allow us to interpret complex inputs, the pressure change in a puff of air, the vibration of the vocal cords and on the jaw as language. What you'll observe in this video is a man, deaf and blind, speaking. He is using only the sensors of his hand in his skin to hear, to process, interpret, and yes, even reproduce the spoken words of his teacher. Remember, he is deaf and blind. He is repeating words that he cannot see or hear by feeling them. Wait just a minute. Greg, right. in fact, in a minute. Did you forget to shut off the water? Did they forget to shut off the water? From the 1950s until today, what all of these techniques have in common is our brain's ability to reconstruct language from components. We are wired to communicate and connect. As you listen to me now, the cochlea in your ear is taking my voice and separating it into frequency components that are transmitted to your brain. Your cochlea essentially does a Fourier transform, a frequency domain analysis of sound. So what if we could do the same work of the cochlea, but transmit the resulting frequency information instead via your skin? That's Freddie. He leads this project. And that's Frances. She's an electrical engineer. She is not deaf and blind, but she can hear through her skin. She has a system of actuators on her left arm they are tuned to 16 different frequency bands. Francis currently has a tactile vocabulary of about nine words. She learned them in less than an hour. The lights indicate the actuators firing, and you'll see that they fire so fast, she must learn to actually feel the words. Okay, Francis, so uh, let's go through the nine words we just learned. We'll do, do some singles, and then doubles, and then get more complicated. All right. Drop. Good. White. Good. Spear. Good. Let's go to twos. Yeah. Lock spear. There you go. Good job. Throw cube. Good. All right. Let's go to the three word sequences. Yeah. Uh, grass, black, cold. Good job. Uh, grass, white, sphere. All right. All right. Throw white, sphere. All right. <laughs> it's amazing. If you ask Frances what she feels, she'll tell you that she has learned to feel the acoustic shape of a word on her arm. The word black moves from low frequency regions to high frequency regions. The word blue is more localized. She processes these shapes in her brain as words. She's learning how to use the artificial cochlea we made for her skin. If we put these two things together, they suggest that one day, not so far away, it may be possible for me to think in Mandarin and for you to feel it instantly in Spanish. Imagine the power such a capability would give to the 780 million people around the world who cannot read or write, but who can surely think and feel. Now, despite being much closer than perhaps you realized, these things are still a few years away. 
And yet somehow it feels urgent to us because we don't always have the luxury of time. I once read an article that said 93% of our face-to-face -face time with our parents is done by the time we finish high school and leave home. Now, most people experience that fact like a kick in the gut. Why? Because it's a profound reminder of the power of connections and that we should do all that we can to increase our sense of presence and connection beyond that remaining 7%. This is my mom. When I moved from the East Coast to the West Coast, I struggled to figure out how to stay connected to her. I tried lots of things, most of them didn't work, and I could feel her drifting away from me. I finally decided that I would try to phone her every day in my car between my house and the coffee shop. It's about five minutes. And each week, I got her a little more often than the last, and the nature of our conversation changed. She told me about her begonias, about the latest exploits of her dachshund, Chloe, who hides my dad's stray socks in unknown locations. I told her about a talk I had to give that I felt a little nervous about. We actually got closer. Because it's not the big moments alone that define relationships. It is the extraordinary every day, the beautifully mundane. And I owe the depth of my relationship with my mom in part to technology. Hands-free and Bluetooth made it possible. Those technological advances made it possible for me to be in my life and still connect with my mom. I'm grateful because my mom is awesome. And I thought you might want to meet her, so we flew her in to say hi. She's sitting right here in the front row. It's my mom. Say hi, mom. I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic that technology can help, that new hardware platforms can chip away at false choices. It's incredibly exciting to do this kind of work. But is it a little terrifying? Of course. Because this matters. Success matters. And so if we fail, it's going to suck. And the only way to avoid that pain is to do work that doesn't matter to you. And that sucks even more. So why do we sign up to being a little terrified each day? Because that's the price we pay for the privilege of making something great. The risk of failure and that slightly terrified feeling that comes with it is the price we pay for the privilege, the honor of making something new. So be a little curious. Commit to being a little terrified each day. And one last thing. Don't forget to call your mom. Thank you.